Good morning. We welcome you today to Alexandria Covenant. We're going to invite you to stand. We're going to worship our God together today. So let's lift our voices. Good morning and welcome to all of you. We're glad that you're here. We're looking forward to our time of worship together. And uh, if you are joining us online, we want to welcome you as well. And if you happen to be a guest with us today, uh, we would just invite you to look at the back of the pew in front of you. There's a connect card and we would just ask that you fill that out and drop it in the offering plate on your way out. It'll give us a chance to get to know you during the week. And if you're joining us online, just know we have an online connect card form for you. It's on our website or on our app. And we would also encourage you uh, to fill that out so that we can get to know um, all of those who are attending here a little bit better. Uh, as we are 
continuing in our time of worship, I want to read from Psalm 117. And the psalmist says, Praise the Lord, all you nations. Extol him, all you peoples. For great is his love toward us. And the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. So in all that we do this morning, singing songs of praise, our prayers, our giving, our receptive hearts toward the message from the word of God, may we be like the psalmist instructs that we would have hearts full of praise as we do this. Let your kingdom come, Father, let your will be done, on earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Father, let your kingdom come, Father, let your will be done, on earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Give us this day.
as we continue in worship together, we just pray that you would be glorified in all that we do and in all that happens here. God, would you prepare our hearts uh, for the teaching from your word uh, that we would be drawn closer to you uh, this morning. We love you. Amen. You can be seated. Good morning, church. So good to be with you this Lord's Day. For those of you online, I want to welcome you also. Uh, it's always exciting when we get to share in the celebration of uh, a baptism. And so I'd like to invite uh, Grant and Paige to come on up with your sponsors and bring Paisley along with you as they make their way up as we celebrate today uh, this uh, commitment by mom and dad to bring their daughter before the Lord in baptism, we recognize how God is at work 
uh, by grace in Paisley's life, and we are excited for that day when she'll make a decision to follow Jesus. Right, Paisley? Yeah. <laughs> Those are good smiles for me and everybody. Thank you. Just prior to his ascension, Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, obeying everything, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you even to the end of the age. Well, today, Grant and Paige are bringing their daughter to the church for the sacrament of holy baptism. We rejoice in God's promises, yeah, to those... <laughs> taking this significant step of faith. The baptism of an infant is not a saving event in the life of a child. We believe that the grace of God is at work in Paisley's life, and therefore we look forward with great anticipation to that day when Paisley will ask Jesus Christ to be her Savior and commit her life to live for him. We believe that the baptism of an infant brings the child under the care and nurture of the Christian church, and therefore, we share in the responsibility of helping Paisley to grow up to know and to love Jesus. So parents, I have a couple questions for you and then sponsors for you as well. Relying on God's grace, do you promise to teach the word of God to your child to pray for and help her in every way so that she may become a true disciple of Jesus? If so, say we do. Empowered by the Holy Spirit, do you promise to enable Paisley to participate fully in the life of the local body of Christ, to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? If so, say we do. All right. Sponsors, do you as sponsors promise to pray for and support these parents and the promises that they have made, as well as to pray for it, help this child to confess the Christian faith? If so, say we do. All right. Well, church family, the Christian nurture of Paisley is not to be left alone by the parents and the sponsors. We, as members of this body, have a responsibility to care for Paisley as well. In receiving and caring for Paisley, will you, as a member of the Church of Jesus Christ, do your part in word and in deed with love and prayer to guide and nurture Paisley, encouraging her to know and follow Christ and caring for her as Christ's own? If so, say, with God's help, we will. Excellent. All right. Well, Paisley, are you ready? I'm ready. Come. Hi. Okay. All right. What do you think of that, huh? <laughs> Paisley, Charlotte Bacchus, I baptize you now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Look what love the Father has lavished on us that we would be called children of God, and that is what we are. Paisley is now brought into the care and nurture of the Christian church. Father God, thank you so much for the gift of this child. I pray that your grace would be in abundance in her life, that she would come to confess you and know you as Savior and Lord early in life, that she would have a long life living for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Here you go, Dad. <laughs> Thanks. Let's praise God. You guys can be seated. Good morning. My name is Scott Stumpf. As you're aware from the bulletin, uh, October is Pastoral Appreciation Month. And here at Alley Covenant Church, we have so much to be grateful for with our pastoral staff. We have them listed in the bulletin. Of course, uh, Senior um, Pastor Trinity, um, Pastors uh, Dave, Pastor Shanda, Pastor Greg, and Pastor Brian. We ask that you keep them in mind, that you continue to pray for them, that when you, if you see them, um, thank them. Thank them and their families for all that they do for our church. From the book of Numbers, the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and his son, saying, Thus shall you bless the people of Israel. You shall say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. So shall they put my name upon the people of Israel, 
and I will bless them. So if you just bow your heads quick, I'll pray a blessing over the, the, the pastors. Heavenly Father, um, you just continue to bless our church. We have so much to be thankful for. We just pray um, a blessing over our pastors for protection, uh, for health, for safety, and um, for them and their families. They give so much to our church, and we are so thankful. We ask this through your son, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's give him a round of applause. Thank you, Scott. It's just a blessing uh, to serve with you alongside of you, so thank you for that. And I wish I had Scott's voice. <clears throat> I have some announcements for you. But I, I don't. <laughs> He's got a great voice. Um, just a few announcements I want to make sure we highlight, and that is today, right after this service, we're doing an exploring membership class in the patio. If you've ever wondered... Um, thought about becoming a member or wonder what membership here is all about, come join us in the patio. We have food and we have child care today, um, and it's just a, a great time to get to know what's happening in our church, kind of our history, our background, what we believe, um, and then any questions that you want to ask. So come afterwards and join us for lunch. Also, this next week is MEA break, which means we don't have any Wednesday night youth activities, uh, Awana or youth group, um, and there's no Sunday school next week uh, because of that as well. So just keep that in mind if you have students or children in that age group. Uh, Sunday night on October 29th is 6 p.m. in the patio is a worship night. It's a chance just for us to get together and spend an extended time worshiping the Lord in music um, and just having some fellowship together. So mark it on your calendar, October 29th, 6 o'clock in the patio. It's also a night where some of our middle school and high school students will be greeting you at the door and helping serve some of the treats because there are treats at night. Um, so come and enjoy that night. It's going to be a, just a great night of worship. In your bulletin, you have an uh, insert with the, about the capital campaign. You've been hearing about this for a little while. Um, and just encourage you as a church body to consider giving towards that capital campaign. Um, it helps to pay off the debt um, that we have on the building and also allow us to do some extra ministry that we are hoping to do. Um, this is a chance for our church body to come together. And also, on, if you're online, we have a growing online community um, out there uh, that don't come regularly to worship here live, but uh, come join us. You're part of our family too. Join us in that capital campaign. You can give a variety of ways. You can fill out one of these forms. Um, you can also give on the church website. Uh, just go to give and you can give towards that capital campaign. But it's a way that we can all pull together um, and reduce this debt. We take an offering at the end of the church. And again, that's uh, at the door and we have an opportunity to give and support the ministries that are going on here, both locally and around the world. Uh, you may or may not know that we have a middle school retreat right now that's up at Trout Lake Bible Camp. Uh, they're just probably finishing up their last session, heading to lunch, and then they're heading home. But your offering helps us to be able to do those kinds of things to reach people and our kids this weekend uh, for Christ and also help disciple some. So thank you for giving. We have a kids church. If you have Kids four years old up to second grade and would like them to go to kids' church, we have some friendly faces out there in the lobby ready for them. You can release them at this time. If you haven't registered them yet, go out with them. They can get you registered. But otherwise, stand up and greet one another. All right. Well, before we get into the message, I do want to give a brief update. Um, many of you are aware that uh, I was scheduled to take a, a group to Israel next week. And um, that uh, trip has been postponed in light of the circumstances on the ground in Israel, which leads me to just asking for your uh, prayers uh, for peace in Israel, uh, understanding that the conflict in Israel is uh, no doubt sad. It's gut-wrenching and heart-wrenching to see what we see on TV with the destruction and the devastation, certainly of property, but more so uh, the loss of lives and families that are being destroyed. Uh, the conflict in Israel is a very complicated matter. And as a church family, I think it is important that we uh, be praying for peace in Israel and that we understand that in the midst of the conflict, the real solution to the ongoing battle between all the people in that area is really the gospel of Jesus Christ. And there is a reality 
of the cross of Christ that we learned about last week, that on the cross of Christ, Jesus killed the hostility that exists between God and humanity, or humanity and God, more or less, and humanity itself. And that there is a way for people to find peace in this world, both with God and with each other. But outside of the gospel of Jesus, that's not going to happen. And so may it be that we pray for all people in Israel, that their hearts would be changed through the message of the gospel. And we understand that there's a lot of Christians on the ground in Israel who we need to pray for and pray that God would shine their light brightly to those around them, that they would hear the message of Jesus Christ and be changed. And so with that, I covered your prayers uh, for, uh, for that situation as it unfolds. No doubt we'll keep our eyes and ears attentive to it and our prayers uh, before the Lord for it. Amen? All right. So now I want to point you to the Word of God uh, for the time of teaching in God's Word. And so if you have a Bible with you, I'd encourage you to open to Ephesians chapter 3. Uh, If you don't have one with you, you can follow along on the screen behind me, or you can grab a Bible from the pew. It might be a, a message that you would want to Uh, have the text before you as we walk through it. Uh, But I'm going to begin reading in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1. I'll read through verse 13 so you can follow along as I read. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly, When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men and other generations as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and members of the same body and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace which was given me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. Please pray with me. Father, as we open your word today, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you will enlighten our hearts and minds to receive the teaching of your word and all that you have in store for us today. In Christ's name, amen. All right, so for those of you who are new today, uh, we've been going through the book of Ephesians this fall, and we're obviously now into chapter 3. By the time we get to chapter 3, the first part of this, it's interesting because uh, many you can say preachers and teachers, uh, tend to either skim over or skip over this section. And I think for a good reason, because it's difficult to preach. And yet I'm willing to just stand in that difficult place and we're going to get through it together. Uh, What we recognize uh, at this point in Paul's letter is that he's actually setting up uh, a prayer for the church. And that's what the book of Ephesians is all about. It's all about the church, and understanding our identity in Christ and who we are and what our mission is and what it is that God has in store for the people of God. And as a result, Paul is uh, beginning to set up a prayer, and then he digresses into this, what we would call maybe a side note or this uh, parentheses before his prayer. And if we look at how the text is written, you'll you'll notice it says in verse 1, for this reason I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles, and then there's a dash. 
Well, that dash is where this parentheses or this, uh, this digression <laughs> begins. And, and the way we see this digression is simply kind of like, have you ever been telling somebody a story and then you're like, oh, and by the way, in order for you to understand this, you need to know X, Y, Z. Okay, that's what's going on here. Paul is essentially writing to the Ephesians and, and, and he's saying, oh, by the way, uh, before I pray this prayer, I want to tell you about who I am as a servant of God in the ministry of being a steward of God's grace that God has given to me about a mystery called the gospel that God has made known to you through me. And as a result of that, it sets up how we are to understand his prayer that's coming in this second half of chapter three. That being said, as we look at this text, there's a lot of great information in here, but my question is, How do we apply this to our life? And I think that should be all of our question when we come to uh, an opportunity on Sunday morning for the teaching of the word. And so here's what I'm going to do. We are not an apostle. We are not called like Paul to be an apostle. But I think Paul's life can be an example to us about how the grace of God that saved us becomes something that God wants us to steward in this life as well. And so we're going to just use Paul as an example of how maybe we are to live our lives as Christians and see how that applies to our life in light of certain situations and circumstances we find ourselves in. So let's begin. We're going to cover four different things in in this passage as we break it out. One is the challenges of life, the goodness of God's grace, the significance of the church, and finally, the privilege of God's people. So let's begin with the challenges of life. I think verse 1 and 13, I'm going to put them together, and and the bookends of this, we're going to recognize as uh, kind of Paul's uh, disclosure to us about either the hardships or the challenges that we find in life and, and how we are to live in light of them. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles, that's verse 1, verse 13 says, so I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is for your glory. Two things there we recognize. Number one, he admits he's suffering. And number two, he admits he's a prisoner. Now, for Paul writing this letter, he could have said uh, very easily, I, Paul, am a prisoner of the Jewish people because I'm preaching the gospel to Gentiles. He could have said, I, Paul, am a prisoner of Rome because the Jewish people uh, were not happy with me preaching the gospel and therefore I was taken captive. And by the way, he is a prisoner of Rome because of the Jews and he's now in prison while he's writing the letter. He also could have said, I'm a prisoner of Caesar. He could have said many things about it, but what he actually says is, I'm a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 13, he says, and my suffering is for your glory. I want you to think about your own life. Is it true that you identify your identity as being in Christ? And that regardless of your life circumstances or where you find yourself at, your identity is not in your circumstances, but that your identity truly is in Christ. For Paul, he was a prisoner, but he identified as a prisoner of the Lord. And you know what that means? I'm sold out, fully devoted, and committed to Jesus Christ. And regardless of my life circumstances, I belong to him, I submit to him, and I will live my life for him. Paul's suffering, we could say, was a matter of perspective. It had purpose. And he didn't want his readers to be discouraged. And so so he reveals his pastor's heart by saying, I know you know I'm in prison, and I know you know my life is hard, but I want you to know that I'm okay as a prisoner of the Lord. And I don't want you to be discouraged because my life and my suffering is for your glory. So don't be down about it. 
sometimes we need to know our why so that we can persevere in life, don't we? For Paul, his why was the advancement of the gospel and belonging to the person of Jesus Christ. His why was, I'm here because I want the Jew and the Gentile to know that there's only one way to the Father, and that's through the Son, Jesus. And for that reason, he's willing to suffer. For that reason, he's willing to persevere in his prison. Knowing our why will help us to identify our purpose in life. Knowing our why will help us to better understand our true identity. So I'm going to give you just a silly, maybe, illustration of how important the why is. If you go and you meet with your doctor and your doctor tells you that you need to exercise, and the reason you exercise, your why behind exercising is because it was a prescription. Your doctor told you so. You're going to go as far as you go on that, if you even go on that, until you're either tired, you're exhausted, you don't see the benefits when you need it or want it, and then you just quit. Maybe the why isn't convincing enough. But how about you choose to exercise because your why is motivated by the benefit that you will gain from exercising? And you begin to see the benefit of exercising in your life, and now you're motivated to keep on going. When you know your why and you know your purpose and you gain an identity, it helps us to persevere in the times when things are hard, doesn't it? Spiritually speaking, one of the things that Paul is doing is advancing the gospel and as a steward of God's grace, encouraging us to advance the gospel. And he's saying sometimes it's going to be hard. And if you don't know why and you don't know your purpose and you don't know your identity, you might just give up. But don't give up because God's grace has changed your life. And like I am to be a steward of God's grace, I want you to be a steward of his grace too. And ultimately what Paul is revealing to the church is that not only is he a servant of God, but he understands he's been called to steward God's grace. So when it comes to suffering, which is certainly part of the Christian experience, it's actually part of the human experience also. If we don't know our why in the midst of suffering, it's likely we'll give up when times get tough. Think about life's circumstances. If you're in a marriage that is difficult and you don't know why you're in that marriage, the likelihood of you giving up is pretty high. If you don't know your why in that God has designed marriage to be between a, a man and a wife for life and that you're to persevere and love each other and love is the sacrificial giving of oneself for the sake of the other. If you don't know your why in the midst of hardship, it's easy to give up and to replace that spouse with another. But God wants us to stay in our marriage and persevere under hardship and he wants us to understand our why. And our why is that God desires that we be reconciled and restored anytime we're broken. And that we do that through the ministry of the gospel and the power of God that comes through the resurrection. If you have hardship in friendships or your career or family matters or personal struggles, we're reminded that through the gospel and the ministry of the gospel, God can actively, through the power of God at work, change our situation and our circumstances. He can reconcile the unreconcilable. He can restore that which is broken and make it new again. I think of my wife and how she had the privilege of sitting with her mom for the last six weeks of her life. And how if she didn't know her why, how hard, much harder that could have been. It was hard. But to be able to care for someone who is somewhat independent to loss of life in just six weeks, she had to endure some real hard times and had to be Jesus, to be his hands and to be his feet, and to love when times were hard. If, if she didn't know her why in that season, it would have been really easy 
to give up. But when you know your why, you can persevere through far more than you could ever imagine. Secondly, we get a glimpse of the goodness of God's grace in Ephesians uh, 3, verses 2 through 6. Assuming you've heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, but has now been revealed to you through the apostles and the prophets by the Spirit. The mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and members of the same body, partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Grace is actually a change agent. If you've ever experienced grace from anybody in your life, you will recognize, number one, that you likely didn't deserve it, but number two, that you absolutely needed it. Paul is saying that the mystery of this gospel that's been revealed to us through the prophets and the apostles by the Holy Spirit is a mystery of grace. It's a message of hope. When we think about the mystery of the gospel, what we recognize is left to themselves, the Gentiles would have never understood God's plan of salvation for them. What God made known through Paul, this mystery of grace, is that now through Jesus Christ, by grace, through faith in Jesus, both the Jew and the Gentile have access to God the Father the very same way. And when they access the Father through the Son, not only do they receive grace that transforms their life, but they become part of one family, the church. By grace, we are saved. By grace, we live according to the gospel. By grace, we are stewards of grace. Grace isn't just something that saves us. Grace is something that empowers and equips us. But why is this a mystery? For us, we think of mysteries as something that we're given clues and then we go on a search to discover. And when we put all the clues together, we can identify uh, the mystery revealed. Paul's not talking about this mystery in that way, that it's left up to us to figure out. What Paul is saying is that up until the time the apostles and the prophets received the message of the gospel to tell the world about, God had kept it a secret about how he would be restoring or reconciling the world back to himself. Remember that when God created all things, Adam and Eve were in good company with God, and then disobedience and sin happened. And as a result of that, relationship with God and each other broke. And from that point forward, God began restoring relationship between people and him and between people and people. And so while we were enemies of God, he makes us friends of God through the cross of Christ. While we live in this world as enemies of one another, we can be reconciled to each other or made right or made friends through the cross of Christ, which we learn about in Ephesians 2, that where Christ went to the cross, he killed the hostility that exists between us, which makes it even possible to have relationship together as enemies. And so, as we understand the mystery of the gospel, we recognize that it's an administration of God's grace to Jew and Gentile, and that through this grace, God saves people. For Paul to be a steward of God's grace, he himself needed to experience the grace of God, and he did in an abundant fashion. Remember, he was on the way to Damascus, and on his way there, he was going to persecute Christians 
who were sharing the gospel. And Jesus Christ showed up and he made himself known. He revealed himself and this mystery to Paul. And Paul was changed radically by the gospel of Jesus Christ. He became a servant of God and then he was called to steward this grace forward. What makes Paul an effective steward of the grace of God is that he himself is a recipient of the grace of God. And that's true for us. I recall when I had a life-transforming experience as a teenager, when the grace of God gripped and overwhelmed me, where I experienced the true forgiveness of God and, and, and I felt at peace with God for the first time in a season in my life where I was so far from God, I thought there was no way he wanted anything to do with me. And as a result of the grace of God gripping me and changing me and transforming me, it motivated me to share this story with others so that the peace I had with God could be experienced by others. And then God called me to ministry. And I said no. And he said yes. And I said no. And he said yes. And I said no. And then I said fine. Isn't that how it goes sometimes? God says yes, and we say no, and he says yes, and, we, and then we finally say, okay, he's got this, and so we go with him. Like Paul, we who have experienced the grace of God are to be stewards of this grace by simply sharing the gospel with others. The Jew or the Gentile in this world will never come to faith in Christ outside of the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And by the way, church, that doesn't just belong to the preacher. It belongs to all of us in God's family. Grace is one of those things that once you get it and you know you got it, you must share it. That's what grace is. Once you get it and you know you got it, you must share it. Paul goes on and he reveals to us the significance of the church in verses 7 through 10. Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. To me, though, I am the very least of all the saints this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Well, Paul recognized that the grace of the gospel that brought salvation to his life and to every Jew and to every Gentile actually brought the Jew and the Gentile together, as he says in chapter 2, to make one new man. And that one new man is the church upon which Christ is the head of. And so now, when we consider the importance of the message of the gospel, what we recognize is that in the day and age that we live, all people who respond by faith to the grace of God and the salvation he offers are brought into the church. There's the big C church, which is Christians everywhere, but there's the little C church, which is what we are, the local expression of the body of Christ. How God was going to reconcile the world back to himself was a mystery of eternity past that is now made known. A mystery that was hidden by God, now made known through what we would call progressive revelation. We find that Paul was given the stewardship of grace to preach to the Gentiles, the unsearchable riches of Christ. And what does that even mean? The unsearchable riches of Christ is the unimaginable or un, un, uh, the, the un, inability to understand the grace of God and the ministry of the gospel outside of God making it known to humanity. It's something that we could not reason on our own. It required God telling us that we couldn't accomplish what we needed 
And so therefore, he sent his son Jesus to do what we couldn't do so that through Jesus and by God's grace and when we trust by faith what Jesus did, we could now be reconciled unto God. We would never come to that conclusion on our own. Yet, it's something that God has made known to us and then he gave to Paul, the apostles, the prophets to tell others about. He did this to bring to light, it says in verse 9, for everyone, what is the plan of the mystery hidden for the ages in God who created all things, get this, so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might be now uh, made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. What in the world is the manifold wisdom of God? Good question. Let's go home. Just kidding, I want to tell you. It's God's brilliant plan of reconciliation. It's the gospel. The manifold wisdom of God is a reference to God's brilliant plan, never before made known, that by the gospel and through the church, God wants to show the world and those in the spiritual realm his plan for making all things new again. I really need you to pay attention for just a few minutes right now because we're entering a space that we don't talk a lot about in the church and that's the spiritual realm. But notice what Paul says in this verse, verse 10, that through the church, through the church, that's us, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. What? Who is that and where are they? We are the church on earth that is making known to the angels and the demons in the spirit realm God's plan of reconciling all things in this world that are broken back to himself. The church, essentially, is God's pilot project to reveal to those in the spirit realm how God's going to restore all that's broken in this world and make it new again. In the spiritual realm... It's Jesus who sits on the throne. It's part of where our dual citizenship lies as Christians. We are in Christ and we are with Christ. In the spirit realm, there are angels and there are demons that are waging war against our souls on earth. In the spirit realm, they are witnessing our life on earth. One of the interesting things is that only by way of maybe a glimpse once in a while do we get access to the spirit world, but the spirit world has oversight of us in terms of they get to see what's going on. Paul talks about this in chapter 1, 2, here 3, again in 6. There's other parts of the Bible that talk about the spirit realm that, that help us understand what's going on there. When the Bible says that there are angels in heaven that are rejoicing when one lost sinner repents of their sin and comes to faith in Christ, their rejoicing is in the spirit realm. For demons interacting with the angels that are in the spirit realm, they're waging war on our soul. They want us to live in conflict and tension and not restored and not uh, reconciled. That's where victory is won, and and what has become a big surprise to the demons and even a big surprise to the angels because they didn't know the mystery of God. They didn't know how he would restore all things. The church is the revelation of how God is doing this. So when someone comes to faith in Christ, the angels are celebrating, look at what just happened, wow! When the world sees the church 
They are to see a new society, a new way of life that is now connected once again to God. A people that are no longer enemies with God, are no longer enemies with each other. Can you imagine that's actually us in Christ? God never said you should like or have to like your brother or sister in Christ, but you got to get along. You got to live in harmony. You've got to forgive. You've got to live with grace and mercy and love. Not only does the world get to see God's redemptive plan through the church, but the spirit world gets to see God's redemptive plan through the church, and they get a glimpse of how this could even become a possibility. So now on earth, as the church, we are to live in this dual citizenship, in this now not yet reality of the kingdom of God, where the kingdom of God and its values are to guide our life as Christians. How we are to love and forgive and reconcile. How we are to not hate. How we are to not be at war with each other. There's nothing more relevant today to the conflict in Israel than the necessity of the gospel to change the hearts so that the enemies can become friends. How about you? How are you doing living out the manifold wisdom of God in the world? Are you letting Christ rule your heart? Are you letting him reign in your life? Are you a servant of the almighty God? Are you a prisoner for Jesus Christ? Are you sold out, fully devoted, and committed to him so that no circumstance in life can bring for you purpose or identity, but that in every circumstance in life, you know your purpose and your identity, and you know your why, and your why is Jesus. Years ago, I'm going to try to illustrate this because this is, this, is this mind-blowing to you or what? Some of you it is. Some of you are like, I don't, whatever. Okay, so how do I illustrate this? I'm going to try. Years ago, there was a show on TV called Candid Camera. Some of you remember this. For those of you who are younger, you're not going to remember this, and that's okay. I'll tell you what it is. Basically, it was a TV show that set up circumstances and situations, and then they put a hidden camera, and they watched how people responded. And then we all laughed because some people would get mad, and some people would be happy, and some people would be confused. And there was all these reactions, and we could relate to that, right? And actually, my parents were on Candid Camera one time with a group of people around a dinner table, and they came to this restaurant, and they had this camera set up, and this table was actually really low, and they were kind of complaining because their chairs were too high and the table was too low. But as the dinner went on, the table would just rise up, and it just kept rising up, and it just kept rising up. And all of a sudden, like... They're like eating and it's getting closer and they have soup and they're like all of a sudden and now you got to stand up and like if I was there, my beard would have caused me to get up sooner. But And then by the time they were all standing around this table, one guy just sat in his chair and just grabbed his food and was going on. Smile, this was the catch line. You're on candid camera. The church, my friends, is being watched how we respond to life circumstances matters. When we live the gospel in life, a life of reconciliation and restoration, a life of hope and mercy, a life of grace, a life of love towards others, when the kingdom values are evident in our life, there's a witness to the world and there's a witness to the heavenly realms about how God is actively at work restoring Humanity back to him. The church is the place where both the world and the angels and demons get a glimpse of God's plan through his son, Jesus Christ. And the life-giving, transforming difference Jesus can make in our relationship with God and our relationship with others. 
If you knew that you were being watched 24-7, how would it change the way you live your life? I mean, if you had cameras set up on you and you were being watched all day, every day, would it change how you live? Would it change how you respond? Would it change what you do? Smile. You're in God's camera. And it's on. And the world is watching. And so are the angels. And so are the demons. And so is Jesus. And everybody in the spiritual realm is paying attention to God's mysterious plan of the gospel and the ministry of reconciliation. And they're able to witness, though lack understanding of the depth and the breadth of it, the reality of it, the implication of it, the life-giving transformation that can take place in the life of a sinner who has become a saint by the grace of God and then given the ministry of stewarding God's grace forward. Like it or not, we are being watched 24-7. Will it change the way you live your life? Lastly, we get a glimpse of the privilege of God's people. The manifold wisdom of God made known through the church to the authorities in the heavenly realm was according to the eternal purpose of God. It simply means that the church was God's plan all along. He's just now making it known to the world. One of the things that we have as Christians in this world is we have access to the Father who is in heaven, who is promised as his children to give to us the riches of our inheritance which means we have access to everything he has that he has made available to us through his son, Jesus Christ. So when you find yourself in any of life's situations or circumstances, I want you to remember that your eyes belong on Jesus, not on your circumstances. That we have access to the Father to ask for help, and that the help the Father wants to give is a help that will make a difference not only in our lives, but in the lives of those around us. So that we can go boldly and we can go confidently into this world, knowing that I'm not living for myself, but I'm living for God. And when I live for God, it's not for my glory, it's for His. And sometimes I'm going to find myself in a place of suffering that has really nothing to do with me but being a steward of God's grace or it may have more to do with the glory of God and your glory. So that that grace that's given to you will become an invitation for you to know the one true and living God. This is the gospel. It's God's plan from the beginning because he loves you and because he loves me. He has made a way for us who, because of sin, are enemies of Him to become friends with Him. Are you a friend of God? Have you, by grace, received the gift of eternal life? If not, it's available to you today. If so, are you stewarding God's grace? so that others in your life can be recipients of His grace too. Let's pray. Father, thank You for Your Word, for the reminder today of the goodness of Your grace. I pray that, God, we would steward it well. For those here who you're calling to salvation, I pray they'll respond. Say, yes, I want to follow you, Jesus. For those of us who have received your grace, that we would recognize our mission in this world and we would steward our grace 
to others. In Christ's name, amen. Please stand as we close in this song together. Praise God for Jesus and all that he has done for us. Amen? Amen. Well, if you are in need of prayer this morning, I want you to know that our prayer team would love to stand with you in prayer up front. And if you have any business to do with God, you can certainly come on up and do that or stay here for a while. and Just right where you're at, you can certainly take advantage of that. But I want to end in this manner. Smile. You're on God's camera. And it's rolling. And the fact of the matter is, the world is watching, and all those in the spirit realm are watching too. 
May we glorify God through the way we live our life as we steward his grace forward to others. Amen and amen. Have a great day. We'll see you next week. Thank you.